and the title of this evening's talk. As you know that much of the time uh, people ask, suggest titles for the talk and this title has been waiting for quite a while. Actually, just before the range retreat somebody sent me an email, I think the last talk had already accepted a title for the talk. Somebody gave me an email, I forgot about it because of the whole range retreat and they repeated the email to me uh, last week. They wanted to have a talk on Buddhism and mental illness. So all of you who are mentally ill, listen carefully. <laughs> now it's not just mental illness. I think one can say that there's like two types of things which are, are meant by this talk. It's like uh, illness of the brain and illness of the mind. I like to make a distinction between those two. Even though I'm not a psychiatrist, even though that I have uh, no degrees in that field, still one understands the mind. I spent my whole monk's life looking at my mind, understanding it, seeing how it works and seeing how it has potentials. And what would happen if you have damage to the brain? Which is one of the causes of what we call mental illness. And some people's brains are damaged at birth or there's something chemically wrong with them, or it happens later on in life. Somebody was asking me a question just before I came in, which is pertinent to understanding about mental illness. They said that one of their friends had some road accident, and uh, they had some damage to their brain, and their personality changed. What happens here? Is the personality sort of uh, something, the, the mind, is it suddenly sort of... Uh, uh, change completely or what's actually going on there and from my understanding from uh, the study of the mind that the brain is something which the mind uses both to understand to know the world and to communicate back again some people have told me I can understand this from my own knowledge of the mind sometimes people have told me that when they have a stroke and they recover afterwards they recover fully afterwards. Sometimes they, their mind wants to move part of their body, but the body doesn't follow the, the, the mind's command. The mind wants to say something, and the words come out completely different than they intended. The mind, the thing which is actually running the show, as it were, underneath, that is unimpaired. That is actually quite clear, but the body through its brain, just will not follow the orders. Sometimes this happens, and sometimes this might happen to you in little ways, either sort of sicknesses or illnesses, or even sometimes in meditation. You can get into such deep states of meditation sometimes. When you come out, just the, you might, the mind might tell you to do something, but the body will just not do it. It takes a while to actually to get those connections coming up again. I do recall when I did that six month retreat in silence. I never spoke for six months in the uh, in, uh, Serpentine Monastery. Some people were waiting for when I come out to see if Ajahn Brahm had gone mad. Some people had dreams. They saw Ajahn Brahm coming out with long hair, a long beard and wild eyes. How disappointed they was <laughs> they were <laughs> when I came out. Not quite the same, because when I came out, I couldn't, it was very hard to speak. For three days I had a headache, because I was having to force myself to talk again. When the mind is that quiet, just the mind, sort of, if it wants to talk, the brain has forgotten how. It actually shows me sometimes just how this brain is almost like the instrument of the mind. It's its tool. It's what receives much of the information from the world, what filters it and what presents it to the mind. And the mind uses the brain to react back into the world. So people with damage to the brain, either at birth or through, uh, throughout their life, sometimes experiencing that difficulty, either some of the world is cut off to them because their brain just won't allow that information to come in. They won't be able to feel a part of their body. They won't be able to be here or to see even because of that damage to the brain. But the mind is intact and clear. 
Another good example of that, of course, is for those of you who know about my teacher Ajahn Chah in Thailand. Either it was because of stress or karma or something or other that uh, he developed uh, this, uh, uh, what's usually called like water on the brain. The brain was secreting lots of liquids and it built up pressure on his brain and unfortunately caused much of that brain to die. So he had almost like a stroke, was paralyzed, wasn't able to speak. And so there was a person, even my teacher, who had brain damage because of a, uh, some condition later on in his life. But it was very fascinating to be around someone who trained his mind so much. Most monks realize that when you talk to him, he would actually pay attention. Especially when his Western monks came to say what was going on in the countries outside of Thailand. We said what was happening in Australia. You could actually see that his body would change and he was listening. And the one reason why we found out that Ajahn Chah certainly was in full control of his mind, even though he couldn't control his body, was that occasion, a fascinating occasion, when Ajahn Chah would go into the deep meditation states. This was a person who was brain damaged, but had trained his mind. What would happen, you've, I've told the story before, it's a great story. What would happen was that because he was such a famous monk, the king of Thailand paid for a nurse, a male nurse, to be present 24 hours of the day. Obviously, not the same nurse. It was in rotation, in roster. And there was always three or four monks who were also doing services for their teacher. And on this one occasion, Ajahn Chah stopped breathing. And the nurse got afraid. The nurse got afraid that Ajahn Chah was going to die. And as I told a story before, the nurse knew Ajahn Chah was going to die, but he didn't want Ajahn Chah to die on his shift. Other people's shifts, okay, but not on my shift. That's problems, especially as a famous monk. So the nurse wanted to try and resuscitate Ajahn Chah, who stopped breathing. The monk said, no, he's just going into deep meditation. And they had this little argument. They came to a compromise. The nurse decided to check Ajahn Chah's blood every few minutes to make sure there's enough oxygen in the blood because as long as there's enough oxygen in the blood there's enough oxygen going to the brain there's no danger to the vital parts of his body and Ajahn Chah didn't breathe for several hours and all the time the oxygen in the blood remained the same to monks who know about meditation that means he got into a very deep meditation Usually what the Buddha said is called the fourth jhana. That was evidence that there was a man, not any old man, who was a great monk, who had brain damage. But his mind was so sharp, so much mindfulness, so much skill, he could still do his jhanas, even in that body which was, which was not working. It shows you what the separation is between this mind and this brain. His brain was damaged, but because he trained his mind, his mind was very alert. Of course, the time when your brain really gets damaged is when you die. And that's when the brain really stops. And I told you last week what happens when a person dies. And how, even though the brain is not working, the mind can still see, hear, feel, but in a completely different way. Not even seeing through the eyes not even hearing through the ears, but seeing in a different way. I'm not sure if many of you might have seen some of the interesting documentaries on the nature of the mind and the brain when one uses hypnosis. I remember seeing this uh, demonstration of hypnosis where this la lady was being regressed to try and remember her past lives. She apparently recalled a past life in Berlin prior to the Second World War or some other, and it wasn't Berlin, it was some other, could have been, no, some other German city. And they showed her a map under hypnosis of the town at that time. And they asked her where she lived. She traced the streets, she told her where she, they, where she lived, pointed out the hospitals, the, ta the other places, the railway stations, the bridges. The important thing was that before she was hypnotized, like many people would do when they sit on the couch, she took off her glasses 
Without her glasses, she normally couldn't see. But under hypnosis, she could see very clearly. It was interesting. Her eyes physically would not be able to see that map. They tested her out afterwards. When she came out of hypnosis, they gave her a map. Can you actually remind us where you were? She said, well, I can need my glasses. She could not see, except under hypnosis. So how was she seeing? In Buddhism, we know that under such hypnosis, you're not seeing with your eyes. You are seeing with your mind. A different way of seeing. The brain would not be working properly. Or the eyes would not be able because of you know, some distortion of the, 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 the eyeball or the, uh, the lens. But the mind is something different. So when we talk about people with brain damage, with that type of illness, sometimes the mind is something else. If you have a brain damage later on in life, if you trained your, lo- your mind, it's not too much of a problem. However, the difficulties sometimes come when people are born with such brain damage. They're either autistic or in some way that we say they're not normal. And for many people who have to deal with such small children in their own family to bring them up, it can be very, very difficult. One of the first things I always ask is, why does this happen? Why does this happen? And last week when I was talking about rebirth and karma, there is a good reason for that. We always need to know the answer why. And it's an obvious answer. There's some cause, not in this life, but in a previous life. The person has to endure sort of not being able to relate in ways which most people do. Some people say that that's really unfair. You know, that what have they done? And because the Western people have this idea that a, a, a baby is born just fresh without any past. And I think all of you who are mothers or fathers, when you sort of have a know the birth of your first child, when you hold them in their arms, and you feel that being, you should know that that's not a being which has just been created in this world. Many people know intuitively that's an old being who has a past, who's come here from another place. Not just you've given that being your body, but their, their mind, their personality, their stream of consciousness, as it says in Buddhism, that's come from somewhere else. They have a character, they have a being, which could not have been created in nine months. This is what we mean by just the being being born. When we actually understand there's a past there, and we can understand that maybe because of some bad karma, because of some heedlessness, because of some cruelty, the person in this life has to endure sort of that type of situation. Karma is the cause. Now when we say that karma is the cause, it's what we are doing with that karma is the most important part of karma. Karma of the past can't be changed. We can always do something with it, as you always know. So karma is never that fatalistic. Even a person who's been born brain damaged, sometimes it's amazing to see what they can do. I recall when I was a young monk in Thailand, in a small village, there was one of the members of that village, a young girl, who must have been about maybe four or five years younger than me, she was also born brain damaged. I just wanted to say also, I was just talking about me. <laughs> I mean, she was born brain damaged. <laughs> and she couldn't speak, but she could grunt. And it was an amazing thing that because of the village society, because she was accepted into that society, because in a village... You have so many aunts and uncles. If they're not aunts and uncles or parents or uh, sisters, they're your friends. So there wasn't just a great big burden on one family to look after her. She was shared amongst the whole village. She had friends. Whenever there was a, a celebration, a festival, music or boxing in the village, her friends would always take her along as well. 
even though that she was in our society someone who would probably be put in an institution. And because she was associating with her friends for so long, she developed this series of grunts which I could not make out at all, but her friends knew exactly what she meant. It was a new language which she developed, and because of association, everyone understood. And that girl was happy. She had her friends. She had her, her life. It may not be the same as other people's lives, but I saw her very often. She would often come to the temple. And I remember one occasion which really moved me deeply. I've told this story whenever I give teachings on generosity. Because on this one occasion I was cleaning up the main hall in this monastery in Thailand. And I was sweeping behind a cupboard in which we used to keep our robes when I heard someone creep into the hall. My first thought was because they were creeping in. Was it a burglar? Was someone trying to steal something? And I looked around the corner of the cupboard and I saw it was this girl. She too was looking around. She didn't notice me. So I actually hid and watched to see what she was doing. And I saw her go up to the main shrine. First of all, making sure that no one was there. Then she went up to the main shrine and she very quickly put onto the main shrine in front of the big Buddha statue a gift. She'd made out of paper a little lotus flower which she gave to the Buddha. She bowed very quickly and then ran out because she was afraid someone would see her, catch her and stop her. When I saw that gift, the way she gave it and knowing how hard it was for her to make that gift, to this day I call that one of the greatest gifts I've ever seen given to the Buddha in that monastery. That was mu worth much more than a person who put a thousand dollar check or ten thousand or a hundred thousand because it was so hard for her to do. And to see the humility, she was embarrassed. But she was given that opportunity to do her act of good karma. And I went up to look at that little paper lotus. It was what most people would say was very ugly, poorly made, the sort of thing that people would throw out as soon as they saw it. But when I knew where it came from, I told all the other monks that that little lotus stays. And if anyone moves that, they'll see Ajahn Brahm get angry. <laughs> it was hard. But because it was hard to do good karma, it was huge good karma. This is how a person, even with limited faculties, can still do good in this world, can still be kind. When I was at university, I had a friend who was a Christian. I, even though I was a Buddhist, I deliberately cultivated, as I do to this day, friends from other religions, because I don't want myself to become narrow-minded. I live with Buddhists. When I come here, I meet with Buddhists. I hang out with Buddhists and if I'm not careful all I think is Buddhism and I've got a narrow mind in the world. And it's very good to associate with people from other beliefs and other religions because they check you out. It gives you a balance. You don't become like cultish. So to this day I've still cultivated friendships with people of other beliefs, people who even don't like Buddhism. I value their comments, they keep me honest. And at the same time, that because I cultivate such people, that I can actually um, learn a lot about tolerance. And uh, I forgot what I was going to say now about the <laughs> about the. Uh, it was coming onto some sort of story, but I'll, I must, maybe I'm brain damaged this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Lost my memory. <laughs> But anyway, as we can make good karma, as we can do good things, you know, no matter sort of what, you know, what our brain damage is, we can always do something with what we've got. And this is actually how people can actually can grow. So when we talk about sort of uh, people having sort of uh, difficult... Oh, sorry, this is the story, I remember now. 
that when I was, um, because uh, I cultivated friendships, one of my best friends when I was a student was a Christian. And when he said that him and his mates were going to go to um, a local hospital to do some voluntary work every week with people who were, um, who they? they were, uh, I think people with Down syndrome mostly, and a few other people who'd been put in a hospital because their parents, they just couldn't cope with them. And uh, he was going to go with his mates to do some social work, to actually to help, to give, and to help with the, um, some therapy work. So as soon as he, sees, he said that, I said, I'll go as well. I couldn't be outdone by the Christians. <laughs> if they can help others, so can the Buddhists. And that was actually my motivation. It wasn't all that good, but I'm being honest. It was just like you know, keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. <laughs> so I went along. <laughs> but I found I really enjoyed it. I went there for two years, going, you know, even during, uh, throughout my univer- last two years of my university career at Cambridge. And then one of the most moving occasions was the last time I went there. No, it wasn't the last time, the second, the second from last, penultimate visit. I'd been going there for so long, the Christians had dropped out a long time ago, but I kept on going. I mentioned that. You see, the Buddhists, they've got sort of staying power. (laughs) That's because they left, that's why, because they went somewhere else. But I kept on going every week. And the last time I went there was in the afternoon. And I was so skilled and so used to it, they gave me like two groups. One for the first part, then we had some tea, then they gave me the other part, all by myself, so the physiotherapist could just actually relax and do some paperwork because they trusted me, I knew the kids. And after the last second class was finished, they called me in. The reason they give me two classes, because when they, I was doing the first class, the second class were making little um, gifts for me, little like actually cards to thank me for being there for so long. Of all the students, I had lasted the longest. And the, while I was in the second class, the first class was doing the same. And these were people who couldn't draw very well. They couldn't make things very well. But they did it especially for me because they thought it was my last time, my last day there. It was one of my most moving experiences when I was at college. To actually to be there in front of all these, these um, Down syndrome's kids and their, their teachers. And they were saying goodbye to me. And they were giving me these gifts. And I knew how hard it was for them to do this. And I almost cried. At that time I didn't know how to cry because I was only a young man, a student. But it really touched me. But I had to ask them. I said, listen, I know you think this is my last day because the final exams are coming next week, but you know, it doesn't actually start till the day after, so can I please come next week? <laughs> I begged to come again. And I w- wondered why was I, why was I wanting to go there again? It was actually enjoyable because I was learning so much to relate to people who had Down syndrome on a completely different level. They taught me so much. Because even though they had Down syndrome, they could not relate in a way in which I was accustomed. Still they could feel. And you could relate to such people on the deeper level, the mental level, the emotional level. Their brains were damaged, but their minds certainly weren't. And some of those kids were very sharp and very smart. If I was feeling off that day, upset, they could pick it up straight away. They knew when to give me a hug. They taught me a lot. And it taught me especially to be non-judgmental. Because sometimes we think, oh, those poor things. Oh, it must be terrible. But I'm just putting on my value judgments. On, I don't know what it's like to be inside a Down syndrome person. Certainly that lady who was in Thailand, I think that was her um, diagnosis, Down syndrome. But she had a happy life. So I think one of the the problems is we understand it's karma from the past, but don't judge that karma. That must be terrible. Why is a person being punished that way? It depends on what they do with that karma. It's the most important part of brain damage. And for those people who have to deal Know, with a child who uh, has some sort of uh, brain damage or some sort of mental disease, then of course it takes a lot of tolerance, a lot of wisdom, a lot of compassion 
So much so that many people take that as a challenge, as a spiritual challenge for their life. Maybe it's their karma. They have to learn such patience, such tolerance and such kindness. Because sometimes it's 24 hours, full, full on. If you can handle that, if you're up to such a high spiritual practice of selflessness, you have immense rewards. Not only do you understand what kindness is, as I keep on saying here, the kindness is the door of my heart's open to you, as you are. You're not trying to make your son and daughter something different. You're not trying to so-called make them better. This idea of better means they're not good enough now. As a Buddhist, we try and stop all of that measuring and say, I'm not trying to make you better. I'm happy that you are who you are. That's what love is all about. That's what compassion is. Not trying to change some, somebody to fit into what you think they should be, but accepting them for who they are. This is called tolerance, peace. That's hard because a lot of times, that, first of all, people feel that the parents, that you've done something wrong, you have some guilt there. Why are they like that? Parents are always into guilt trips with their kids. I don't know, maybe my mother thinks she feels very guilty that I ended up as a monk when I could have been a doctor or a business person or something else. But no, no, she's come to peace with that now. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. I've seen that happen with some, some parents. The, the child becomes a monk and then other, their friends come and say, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> You've got two of my monks in the monastery, they're brothers. And their mum was very upset when the second one became a monk. She said, I'm all right giving you one, but giving you two, that's a bit much. <laughs> Can't I have one? <laughs> but parents are often into guilt trips. Sometimes their child becomes a homosexual. And they don't tell their, their friends. Why not? What's wrong? What are you upset about? Isn't love accepting the person for who they are? And can't a parent at least give that type of love to their child? If they become a monk, or if they're mentally disabled, can we accept them and give them that love? The door of my heart's open to you, no matter who you are. No guilt, but acceptance. That will be half the battle, I would say, in dealing with somebody in your family who is so-called uh, brain damaged, who's got some mental disturbance. But of course you have your limits as well because sometimes it just, the amount of work, the amount of attention is sometimes so much. And in Buddhism, as I was always taught, that loving kindness will always, will have to go two ways. The door of your heart is open to you as well. Loving kindness goes to all other beings and that includes yourself. And so the person who asked that question, I'm sure that they want to know that how can they, as a mother, as a father, of somebody who is um, mentally imbalanced, I don't know what the right word is, I find it hard actually to find that word, but I think you all know what I'm talking about, who is brain damaged or what we call not ordinary. I, I hate that word, not ordinary, because you know, what is ordinary? I'm the most unordinary, no, not I, I've got three other people who are weird in sitting next to me this evening. <laughs> now look at us. If anyone is like uh, sort of mentally strange, and it's people who give up sex, you know, give up drinking, don't watch movies, don't, or not worried in mo uh, with money. If we did a psycholo psychology test, you know, we'd be in big trouble. I remember once, you know, having somebody who had a uh, epileptic th fit in our, mon uh, in our temple, our old temple. And as soon as the ambulance came, we had to call an ambulance. The first question they asked was, what day is it? And that's a standard question to actually to find out whether you're in your, in, in your, uh, whether you're sane or not. A lot of times I don't know what day it is because you live in the moment. You're mindful. You, you let go of the past, let go of the future. You forget what day it is. So I'm very, very concerned if I have an accident that an ambulance man will come along. And the next thing I know, I'm in Greylands because I can't remember what the day is. <laughs> so 
so we're really weird here. But you no, know, the idea of what's ordinary, let's you know, put that aside. So, but a person who is very, very difficult to bring up because they need so much attention, every now and again you have to give yourself attention as well. Take time out and not feel guilty about that. Loving kindness, care has to go both ways. But again, just acceptance and non-judging. Who is ordinary and who's not ordinary? This is actually brain damage, which is very easy to actually to see. But mental illness is something different. Because that mental illness, the Buddha said, is anything which is greed, hatred and delusion. And each one of you is mentally ill. Each one of you is. Look at it. What a stupid way you live your lives. <laughs> Why do you get angry at others? Does that really help you? That's actually being mentally ill, getting angry at others. You know that story which I told about the person who went to the market because they had to get some eggs. They were abused by a man in the market who called them all sorts of terrible names. They got very upset. When they went back home, they finally found out that that man who abused them had fallen when they were young. They'd hit their head and they were crazy. And they did that to everybody. When the person who was abused found out it wasn't abused because of themselves, it was the person was crazy, they'd hit their head. They didn't mind anymore. If somebody shouted at you, if they called you names, if they called you camel face. <laughs> That's the worst I can say, being a monk. <laughs> Would you get upset and angry? If you knew they were crazy, it wouldn't matter. you wouldn't get angry back. Now, you know the punchline of that story. The Buddha said that anybody who calls you camel face, or even worse, they are insane. They're crazy. Only a crazy person would say something like that. I've seen a camel, and I can see you. And there's a great difference there. <laughs> but why is it we get upset? Always remember, if someone abuses you, if they get angry at you, if they call you names, that's temporary insanity. If your husband starts to sort of get cranky at you, if your wife starts to shout at you, just remember they probably just hit their head that morning. <laughs> well, maybe you might have hit their head. But they're temporary insane. So if they are, you look at them as temporary insanity, they can call you whatever name they like. And you don't move, you don't get upset. That's why the Buddha said, anger is insanity. You don't get your way. It never really um, fulfills the objective. You can get far more out of the person you live with, out of the people who work for you, if you don't get angry. There's other psychologi psychological ways to get what you want. I know those ways. I've been cultivating them all the time to get what I want out of my monks. Get what I want out of you lot as well. <laughs> you know, this is a story of actually psychology and how to have control over your partner. Because when I first came here to Australia, I was number two monk. There was another monk who was supposed to be the boss. Ajahn Jakaro, his name was. But I always figured out how I could get my own way, even though I was number two. This is a story which I say. I wanted to build a hut up on the hill. So I went up to him and said, you know it would be a good idea if we built a hut up on the hill over there. And he would say, don't be ridiculous. He always used to say that, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, okay, never mind. And I wouldn't push it. Because I knew psychology. All you need to do is to put the seed in the mind. Because they'd always think about it, no matter what they say. Even if your husband said, that's a stupid idea, that's ridiculous. Where did you get that idea from? That's absolutely ridiculous. doesn't matter. You've said it. It's in their mind. They're going to process it. <laughs> <laughs> so I left it for another couple of weeks. And just to reinforce it, because sometimes these things need to be reinforced. When I thought he'd forgotten, I said again, you know, I think we should build a hut over there on top of the hill. And again, you say, don't be ridiculous, it's a stupid idea. Oh, okay, forget it. And it always worked. It was amazing. 
Two weeks later, he came up to me and said, you know Ajahn Brahm, I think we should build a hut over there on the hill. <laughs> and I'd always say, that's a very good idea of yours, Ajahn Chakra. <laughs> It's how to get your own way. You don't have to get angry. Use psychology. It's the same with your kids. Many of you want your kids to come and learn Buddhism, come to the Buddhist Centre on a Friday night. The way to get them to come here is to tell them you cannot come. <laughs> you're banned, you're barred. This is not the place for you. <laughs> There's lots of psychology, but you don't have to get angry. But also kindness is one of the best ways because when you're kind to others... People want to help you. It's amazing, just in business, if you're really, really kind to the people you work with. I mean, they need a day off because you know their, their son is sick in hospital. I'll take the day off, go on, I'll cover for you. And that person, they will help you out much, much more. You'll get that day double, tripled because they really want to help someone who's helped them. So be kind, that's the way. So anger is mental illness. It makes no, po no sense at all to get angry. It's the same with like, like craving or wanting. That's mental illness as well. What do you want? And what do you want it for? After a while, when you say, what's this for? If I get this, then what? So what? How many of you want to win the lotto? That's mental insanity, mental craziness. Number one, you've got no chance. <laughs> Number two, if you did win the lottery, then what? <laughs> so, so there's a lot of like mental insanity, mental craziness. The biggest mental craziness is guilt and worry. That's real mental illness. Why are you feeling so guilty? Why can't you forgive? You make mistakes. I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Being a human is to make mistakes. So you can forgive other people. Why can't you forgive yourself? Sometimes it's in our culture to have blame and victims. Somebody blew up the World Trade Center. Let's, let's get them back. Somebody killed my son. I'm not going to rest until I get my revenge. That's craziness. You can see that in Northern Ireland, you can see that in the Middle East, you can see that in your lives. You can see like husbands and wives, once they get divorced, you want revenge. I want to get my own back on that. Oh, I can't say it, camel face. <laughs> so, so why do we do that? Does that help anybody? Obviously the answer is no, it doesn't help anybody at all. It's insanity, it's mental illness. That's why that in Buddhism we have a standard of what mental sanity is and what mental illness is. And how we deal with mental illness is actually realize that this is causing us suffering, it's causing us pain. Why are we doing this? And we find a way of letting it go, of transcending guilt, transcending worry. Imagine what it's like when you're not a person who worries, when you're not a person who's guilt, who feels guilty, when you don't carry the past, nor do you anticipate the future so much. How much more free you are. That mental freedom is called mental sanity. When a person doesn't look after their mind, when they allow um, ideas of guilt, Depression is very much caught up with guilt, with negativity towards the past. When they develop fear and worry about the future, fear is about the future. And they develop that and they don't allow, well they allow it to actually to build up. That can drive you crazy. That's not like illness caused by brain damage. That's illness caused by mind damage. And you are responsible for that. You had a choice to actually to train your mind, to develop it, and you've let it go in a wrong way. And I always say letting go, but I mean you sort of, you know, you haven't really trained yourself. And you can see that mental illness, what it does to people. 
sometimes people feel so guilty about something they've done. It warps their whole life. It stops them enjoying this life. It stops them actually being a person, having relationships with others, being at peace with themselves. It stops them smiling. That's mental illness. Like physical illness causes you pain in the body. Mental illness causes you pain in the mind. What are we doing that for? After a while we realize that no one else is making us do this. We're doing this because of wrong attitudes of mind. Which is, this is the places where Buddhist practice such as mindfulness and meditation can really help. We see what we're doing. Honesty, truth, the mindfulness in the moment to see what's happening. Too often we're in denial to our mental insanity, to our mental illness. And this is the big problem. We don't realize it's there. Having monks around, sane people, gives you other, <laughs> gives you other ways of judging. There's is, is, is other models. Sometimes we say, oh, everybody's doing the same. Everybody you know, uh, gets guilty. Everyone has fear. I say, no, that's not true. There are people who don't feel guilty, even though they make mistakes. You know one of the times when I made a mistake? That time when, oh, I think, uh, I'd just taken over, I think, after Ajahn Chakra left. And I was walking around the monastery on a tour of inspection. And when I was walking around, I found a hammer which was left in the bush. And it was getting rusty. It obviously been left out for many days. And I was always a very frugal. My family were very poor when, where I grew up. So we didn't really have very much. And I knew from all the people actually donated to my monastery, they weren't rich people. Sometimes they put one dollar in and they had to save up for that. Somebody had offered a hammer to my monastery in Serpentine to help with the building work and some negligent monk had left it out in the grass to get rusty. That wasn't, that wasn't on, that wasn't good enough. So I called a meeting, all the monks, that evening. And you see here I, where I give talks and there are lots of jokes, lots of, you know, in the monastery sometimes it's different. That evening it was fire and brimstone. <laughs> and all the monks, they were sitting dead straight. <laughs> and not a smile on their faces. So I really laid it into them about, as monks, you're responsible. This, you, know, you didn't work for that hammer. You didn't earn it. There was some probably very poor person who saved up for, for weeks to buy that hammer. And you're so careless, you don't even bother to put it away. You leave it there to rust. That's no way to treat people's generosity. And I really laid it on the line. And when the talk was finished, I was very, very disappointed because not one of those monks confessed. Not one of those monks admitted it was them. Because I thought, even though I was pretty tough that evening, I thought, well, you know, I wouldn't sort of, you know, really punish them. We got a new punishment now in the monastery. I gave this punishment to one of the visitors, because they, they said they, they said some bad things to the monks, so I gave them 50 strokes of the cat. <laughs> we do, yeah, 50 strokes of the cat. We've got this little cat in the monastery called Kit Kat. They had to stroke it 50 times. <laughs> it's, a great w it's a great way of punishing somebody, give them 50 strokes of a little pussy cat. <laughs> but anyway, so I wouldn't punish anybody. There's no punishment there, but I was just disappointed. No one was honest enough to actually to own up. And I went out of that talk just feeling just so deflated, so disappointed. I lost my faith in my fellow monks. You can understand what that's like. Now these are supposed to be honest, good people. People, you know, who have got that sort of inner integrity. And I felt so sad and so... Ugh. And it was only when I walked out of our main hall that I realised why none of those monks had confessed. Because I remember who'd left that hammer out. <laughs> it was this monk. I left that hammer out completely forgotten. And it was really just really awful. That you only remember just after you tell everyone else off. <laughs> it was very, very embarrassing. <laughs> and my calm is actually to tell that story often, actually to <laughs> assuage my guilt. 
And I did feel guilty. I forgave myself straight away. <laughs> so why I feel guilty about these things? We all make mistakes, sometimes silly mistakes, sometimes terrible mistakes. But the wise person is someone who can forgive others and forgive themselves. Acknowledge, forgive, learn. Otherwise we're being mentally ill. We're stopping ourselves being happy, being at peace with ourselves. We learn from it, we never do it again. But we learn, acknowledge and we forgive. Otherwise you find because of things like guilt, things like grief, the loss of a loved one, things like anger, we can think and think and think until we do make ourselves mentally ill. These are the causes for excessive thinking. We think so much that it basically burns out our brain. And I've seen, I remember seeing one person become mentally ill because they couldn't stop thinking. It's almost like getting into a rut, seeing things only in one way. And the mind, or rather the thinking, just got stronger and stronger and stronger until they couldn't take it anymore. And the fuses blew and they had to go to the local hospital. And you can understand why. When I see that, I understand just how if you don't stop these silly ways of thinking, whether it's guilt, whether it's grief, whether it's anger, whether it's fear, if you don't do something about that, they can grow so out of, out of hand, they can make you become crazy, become mad. Not being able to communicate with the world, not even being able to communicate with yourself. I can understand sometimes it gets so painful that a person retreats deep inside of themselves and never comes out again. Catatonia. People who refuse to relate to the world, they go to this place deep within their mind, not willing to come out because they don't trust the world anymore. It's just too painful, or rather, they've made it too painful. Sometimes it's like going to the concrete bunker inside your heart. You feel safe there maybe, but you're not alive anymore. You can't feel, you can't smile, you're just too deep inside because life has been too painful for you and you haven't related to it in a wise way. The wise way is to let go of the pain of the past. Don't carry it around, don't keep thinking of it because every time you think about it you're amplifying it, you're building it up stronger and stronger until something which was a small thing becomes huge. You know the way that someone, as the old saying, someone calls you camel face. Why do they call me camel face? They've got no right to call me camel face. I'm not camel face. You're thinking about it every time. And every time you think about it, you call yourself camel face one more time. If you just say someone called you camel face and you stopped, it's gone, it's finished. Why keep thinking about it? Someone in your families died some years ago. They're dead, they're gone. Why do you keep thinking about it? Every time you think about it, they die in your heart once more. And you feel the pain again. You've had a divorce which was very difficult. You think about that. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Every time you think about it, you have to relive the pain. Why can't we let it go? We can't, why can't we let go of the coffins of the past, as I say? Bury them and stop carrying them around on our head. Otherwise, the past can drive us crazy. Or rather, not the past, but obsessive thinking about the past. Many people live in that past. They identify with that past. They are that past. And they suffer that past. That is mental illness. Okay, it may be not so severe that you can't c live in the world, you can't cope in the world. You get by, but you don't really get by. You're not really happy and at peace. As with those people who fear the future, 
the paranoids. The mind goes out into the future, what might go wrong? If you keep thinking in that way, training your mind to just see the faults in the future, the life becomes so fearful, you never even go out of your house. You're too afraid of what might happen. Later on this evening, I'm going in an aeroplane over to Singapore. I just read in the newspapers about all these bombs which people can actually assemble outside and then they go into the toilets and put them all together and blow up the plane. Oh, isn't that scary? Not for me, who cares? If I get blown up, I don't have to give any talks anymore. (laughs) 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 Got to die some way. That's one of the best ways of dying, being blown up in an aircraft. You know why? Three reasons why I've been... A uh, blown up in an aircraft is one of the best ways of dying. Number one, instantaneously, you don't feel anything. Number two, you're um, cremated on the spot. You don't have to worry about, <laughs> about any sort of funeral bills. And number three, your relations get an insurance payout. <laughs> so the, body can, the Buddhist study can probably make a lot of money if I get blown up. <laughs> now what you're saying is you're not being afraid of what's going on. Who knows what's going to happen? But sometimes people can think, think, think so much, they get just crazy. So this is what we mean by the difference between the the physical uh, brain damage and the mental illness. You know one of the last mental illnesses which I wanted just to go over before we stop is Alzheimer's. When you start forgetting things. Why do we forget things? The Buddha was actually very clear with this. He, he's, he's got this, uh, he made this connection 2,600 years ago between awareness and memory, mindfulness, sati in Pali. What we train ourselves to do in meditation is the cause of a strong memory. And this is one of the ways that you can avoid Alzheimer's. The way you can avoid to dementia by training the mind in this mindfulness, being alert, being aware, training that alertness, training that awareness. And what is that alertness, that awareness? That's being in the present moment, being silent, listening with everything you've got instead of always having a conversation about the world. If you're having a conversation about the world, you cannot be listening. If you're thinking, you're not mindful. You have to be alert, fully alert, giving it everything you've got. In my meditation talks, I say that the more energy you give into reacting to the world, in thinking, in doing, in complaining, in guilt, in fear, The more energy goes in there, the less energy is going in to the knowing, being mindful, being alert. And after a while, there's no energy left for awareness. The mind becomes dull. When it becomes dull, it doesn't really know what's going on. When it doesn't know what's going on, it remembers very little. Memory is awareness, alertness. I had a good memory when I was a a child at school. When it came to exam times, I could remember the questions and also the time when the teacher taught us that lesson. Because every time that teacher was talking, I was paying full attention. I was alert. And that's why I could remember. Even at college, at university, I paid full attention. That's why I remembered. Even listening to teachers like Ajahn Chah. Pay full attention. Make your mind so peaceful. You don't talk back, but you listen with everything you've got. That's called mindfulness, alertness. You remember things that way. Because of awareness, alertness, you maintain your memory. So if you want to be sharp in your old age, and many of you are very close already. <laughs> if you want to be alert in your old age, 
practice that mindfulness? Because it's training the mind, making the mind strong, exercising the mind. You know that if you want to have a fit body, you have to exercise the body. If you want to stop physical illness, you exercise and eat well. If you want to stop mental illness, illness such as fear, guilt, grief, anxiety, you have to eat good food, good mental food. And where is the best mental restaurant in Perth? Dhammaloka Centre on a Friday night. Here you eat health food for the mind. Dhamma it's called. And if you want to exercise the mind, meditation. That's why meditation is just so powerful for most mental illnesses. Brain damage, you can't do much about it. But at least you can have the strong mind to deal with those problems, with peace, with happiness. But for your own mental illnesses, if you don't practice meditation, if you don't train the mind, then it's like not exercising the body. If you only eat junk food for the mind, like watching movies or the TV, looking at the bill, then, ha <laughs> I know what you get up to. <laughs> Then you'll be in trouble at your old age, you start forgetting things. You see what happens when a person watches a box. <laughs> After a while you end up like that, you know. <laughs> so be careful if you want to be mentally fit, mentally agile. This is what you should do. So the time is up. I remember what time I'm supposed to finish. <laughs> so I haven't got Alzheimer's. It's interesting, you know, they've never seen i never actually seen a monk with Alzheimer's, even very old monks. And some of those old monks are just so sharp. 70, 80, they remember everything. 90. There was this 102, was 100, that Cambodian monk, he was 102, 103, still traveling around the world on the airlines. Fit, could remember everything. Why? Because mindful. So if you want to be mentally strong, you want to be mentally alert, if you want to stop mental illness, not other people's, but yours, then you know where to come. Okay, so thank you this evening for listening to the talk on uh, mental illness and Buddhist uh, response to mental illness.